Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Life in the Wick podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Spalding, and I'm here today with Tamara Merrill and Jerry Stravey. And this is podcast number two in our series about getting started, getting started writing your own book, writing your own story. So Jerry and Tamara talked with us in the last podcast about kind of the basic overview of steps. Today we're going to talk about the actual process. What are those steps within the steps that you're going to take? So the process of writing. Are you all ready? We're ready. Definitely. Okay, let's jump in because here's the hardest thing to know. Um, how do you do it? Like how, what is the very first thing in the process of writing? You need to schedule the time to write. You need to say to yourself, I am going to do this. And then you need to be consistent. So like scheduling, like just put scheduling, it just, just schedule it. Commit. However works for you, commit. I am going to write every day and then do it. Or I'm going to write once a month, but do it. Whatever, Whatever you your commitment to your writing is, you need to actually physically schedule the time and be consistent. Okay, how much time? Depends on how much time you have in your life. Um, if you're the mother of small children, maybe you can only schedule five minutes a day or 15 minutes a week or an hour at a time. All it takes is a schedule where you promise yourself, this time belongs to me and I'm going to use this time to write. What about you, Jerry? How much time do you schedule to write? Well, actually, I don't schedule by time. Um, well, I look We're at it. Hitch and our get along here, Jerry. We <laughs> thought we had a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it's like um, number of words. I have a prescribed number of words that I would like to get to every day, and it's kind of funny. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes I write more, sometimes I write less, but I try to average out a special number of words. I got that from uh, Stephen King, actually. He does that every day. I did read that years and years ago about Stephen King. Like he writes like twenty thousand words a day, or something. no, he That's writes better. three thousand. Three thousand words. Ah. So he starts at nine in the morning, and he hopes to get done by eleven or eleven thirty. And if he isn't finished in by that time, he has to continue writing before he can go out and run errands or go play or whatever he's going to do. Right? Do. Okay, yeah. so two ways to do it. You right. Can block off time, block mm -hmm. a little bit, lots of time, whatever mm -hmm. it is, or mm -hmm. you can set a goal for how many words. Right. You're going to get down in a day or over the course of a week or however. So that's time right. Time or word count. Okay. So that's your first thing. When you're talking about the time and you asked me earlier how how much time it, it's up to you, I personally schedule two hours a day. That I The first two hours of my day is when I write. Okay. So that's, that is the question, I guess. So if you're going to write for two hours or if you're going to write 3,000 words and it takes you about two hours, that, that like, is it? How do you keep yourself focused for that entire time? Especially because if you work from home, it's really hard. You're like, I could start laundry. I should go get the mail or I could do this. So how do you actually, like, are there any tricks to buckling down? Or? I think the trick is um, you resist the impulse. You have to keep your seat on the chair. You will not write if you're out doing the laundry. Um, the laundry actually can wait until your time or your number of words are up. If, you're, if your baby's crying, okay, you might have to get up and go do something. But you consistently need to allow yourself to have the amount of time you promised yourself or the number of words you promised yourself. Um, and I think number of words is easier when you have an inconsistent amount of time. I'm fortunate, I'm retired, I can do whatever I wanna do. So I can say from seven to nine, I am not going to answer the telephone, I'm not going to answer the door, I'm going to pretend I'm not home. I wanted to add something to that, real life, writing. You know, writers, we sometimes we are stuck. And I don't wanna call it writer's block, but we're just not sure maybe how to write something. And what I do, and I have the luxury because I'm doing number of words, I will sometimes stop, get up, make a cup of coffee, or go for a walk, or actually, you know, do something that just distracts me for a minute so I can come back and attack it. But the whole idea is I am bound to like get that number of words in there, okay? 
So by the end of the day, come hell or high water, you are going to finish your words. In an ideal world. In a perfect <laughs> world. Do any of us live in a perfect world? No. But I think this is a perfect world here, right? This is a perfect world. Yeah. Maybe this is a perfect world. Along those same lines, I trick myself. So when I finish writing for the day, I write the next line of the next thing I'm going to write. And then I go away. And when I come back in the morning, I read what I wrote the day before. And I know exactly what to finish that paragraph that I started. So I trick myself into having a kickstart every time. Perfect. All right. Good. So it's interesting. Also, um, I've done some reading about motivation. And for certain people, going outside is a really, really important kind of what you were saying. Like, I'm just going to step away and come back. So one of the keys, it sounds like, is knowing yourself. Like, exactly. what are you? What works best for, just because something works best for tomorrow or Jerry, you may need to modify that, that to something that works best for you and sometimes getting outside. They call it a green fill up actually in the book that I was reading, like it's just kind of a refresh right. for your brain. So, Okay, so you're gonna schedule your time and then what are you gonna do? What do you, what is the physical process? What happens next? Well, now you need to start actually writing something during that physical time that you're sitting there because otherwise you're just sitting there. So um, I have an idea for a book and my physical process is that I get this idea and I carry around a journal all the time. Everything I have, there's a journal somewhere on my person. And so I start jotting down things in the notebook and I write my plot in the notebook, not not word for word, not what's going to happen from the beginning to end, but the overall general outline of this plot. And um, so then... So as an example of that, we talked about it when we were prepping for this. You talked about... Oh, so sure. The last book I wrote was um, Just One More. And I knew that I wanted to write about a female serial killer who talked to crows. And that is the whole story idea. The second part of that story idea was an old nursery rhyme, one I love, two I love, three I love, they say. And I thought that I was going to write to that nursery rhyme. So in my plot book, I have that whole nursery rhyme written down. And so she was going to murder 13 times following this nursery rhyme. And um, that didn't work. But it is the first in my plot. And all throughout my book, that nursery rhyme kept my plot on track, even though I ditched the nursery rhyme along the way. But because I knew that that was the plot, I also knew that the number one character was going to be a girl named Harriet, and she was going to be nine years old when the book started. So I started skip a whole bunch of pages because I like to keep the, keep the plot together and the characters together. And I have a third section for um, scenes like places that where it takes place. But so I would I flipped to the character part and I wrote Harriet and then I went on the internet and I looked for the worst last name. And so if this is your last name, I'm very sorry, but the Google search came up with the worst last name was Blim. And so Harriet's name is Harriet Blim. And um, and that's and that page for Harriet simply said she was nine years old. Okay. Then I started writing the book. A few days into it, I added to the character plot that Harriet had curly hair, that Harriet was a championship speller, that Harriet had a very dysfunctional family, which led to more character so sketches. Start I, character I start with the character sketches, and all the time that plot is growing because as I discuss as I'm writing, I'm adding to the plot. By the time I'm halfway done with the book, the notebook has the plot clear to the end. And by that point, it's changed considerably. But you don't have to start with anything major. Like she's saying no. her first plot the whole story in a sentence, boom, one serial killer who talks, talks to, to crows. crows. So you don't, it doesn't have to be crazy, right? No. So it's kind of like writing a business plan. Some people write 1,000 pages. Most people could get it done in a page. So it's kind of it. Don't start small, but, but start filling in the details as you go along. Now, what about you, Jerry? How do you do it? Do you do the same thing? Do you physically write it, hand write it out in a notebook? No, I don't. That's the good news and the bad news. <laughs> because I don't write it out. Actually, I keep it all in my head. Uh, and sometimes it gets a little confusing. Uh, you can have a, a blue-haired gal end up with uh, green eyes later in the book, and you're going, whoa, that's when we'll get to this later. That's when you're glad you have a good content editor. But uh, no, I don't uh, write these things down. I kind of develop uh, my characters along the way. I have, and you'll hear a lot as we go along, I have a rather analog brain. 
and um, typical dudes. Yeah, it's typical. And so uh, they, I know what they're going to look like um, as I go along, and I try to keep it straight. So no, I don't have all these uh, notebooks and what have you going on. The do disc- you write straight through the story? I absolutely do. I write straight through the story, and I am, I am a, a situational writer. So as as this, again, I know where the plot is supposed to go. Never ends that way, by the way. But I know where it's supposed to go, and as I create my characters in my brain, uh, you know, I internalize them. I have conversations with them and I talk to them and I experiment with the way they're going to be acting what they're going to be doing so do either of you like when you say that like I talk to myself all the time right like out loud do either of you ever have a conversation with a character that you actually just turn on the recorder on your phone or on your computer and record the conversation the that you're having I, I used to not so much now but I used to be driving a lot I was in the car a lot and um so I do whole dialogues where you I get record them. I do. I record. That's what I said. I did in the car on my little recorder, my telephone nowadays, but back in those days it was a recorder. And um, I do both sides of the conversation. So I actually sound very much like I'm talking to myself and I'm answering myself. Um, do you ever lose any arguments with the characters? I never lose an argument, Jerry. Never. <laughs> you should know that. Okay, so just kind of a <laughs> little insight into this relationship here. Um, these two are like brother and sister. They're not related at all. They've sort of adopted each other. Tamara is very much the big sister, right? I'm just in charge. That's right. Just in and charge. I'm right. And um, Jerry knows that she's right, and so things work well for them. I call her the oracle. He does. Yeah, I, and that, that is a fact. That is, that is yeah, a so fact. I don't really have to think when <laughs> she's around. I just, you know, just go with the flow it's so much easier what i think but i did want to talk about one thing about the characters though um i don't write I, I don't record the characters but i do like i'll go on a walk or something like that when i'm trying to develop a situation and i will in my head the conversation is going back and forth okay and but you it, don't actually say it out loud i'm not that weird no <laughs> I no I know. so I I, 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 like i said i'm not that weird we but are, we are uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but th- that's the way I do it. And again, if I could only get back to this, these characters, so like with so many other writers, they become, re- they take a life. They take on a life form in your life. I mean, but also conversely, when the book is over, they're done. They're no longer my friend. I moved on to something else. They've right? Dumped. Yep, they've been dumped. Yeah. All right. I use them. That's actually a really interesting thing because one of the things that happens to us as writers is people years later, uh, my first book was a book called Family uh, Family Lies, whatever the name of it was, and people will say to me, so why on page 32 did, and I'm, and I'm thinking, who? What are you talking about? I don't remember who you're talking about, which is kind of embarrassing, but it, it for a while, um, She's my daughter, so I probably shouldn't say this out loud. But for a while, your characters are more important than anything else in your life. When you're at the point of your book really rolling, they're your best friends. They're your worst enemies. They're the people you, they're they're in your life every single minute. And you can be doing something else. And there's this little piece of your brain going, so I wonder what Sylvia would do right now. I bet she's, you know, I mean, it's just weird how it is. They're more real we're not actually schizophrenic, but they're more real than reality. All right. Okay. So I want to say one thing. We got to move on. I know we do. Quick, okay. Quick. I just finished a book and it's going off to the editors now. I have another book and it's always in the back of my head this next book. Okay. What's going on? It never, never leaves you. So be prepared. If you start writing a book, you may have this mental disorder that they've got. All right, maybe with you forever. Okay, so you um, do longhand. You just start out writing, like it's all in your head and you write digital. Um, when you're actually ready, what what program do you use? Like what's your digital program preference and why? I actually use Scribner, which is a software that is meant for writers. It is meant for all types of writers, screenplays, stage plays, um, nonfiction, fiction, and it has different sections in it to use for each kind of writing. The reason I love like Scrivener is, um, first of all, I'm computer literate, uh, which also Do helps. <laughs> so, and it is, um, but I like to write 
a chapter at a time. I write from the beginning of my book to the end of the book, and I like to keep my chapters separated, and I often rearrange them. So I, so in Scribner, I can actually write inside a chapter a scene at a time, and then move them around with easier than I can in any other word processing program. So I use Scribner. It's not particularly expensive. It's about $45. Um, if they're, they're, Annual? No, it is one-time pay. Um, and it's on both Macintoshes and um, PCs. And um, the other piece of Scribner that I really like is when I'm done with the book, I can push the file format and, and have it ready for publication. So it's all one step. Do you use Scribner also, Jerry? I tried it. <laughs> I didn't like it. Tried it. I didn't use? like it. Um, I just use my Word program. And so Why do you think you like Word better than Scribner? Um, because Word is more closely um, associated with my analog brain. Uh, it's just Scribner... Well, I think it's a marvelous program, and I have tried it, and I was really excited about getting into it. I thought it could do all these wonderful things. That is not the way I think. I don't write one chapter at a time. I march forward and go through it. So for me to have to go back into Scrivener and organize everything and adapt to the way they do things would uh, slow me down, and I would get— a, Do you write your whole book in one document? I write my whole book in one document, and so— now, there's advantages and disadvantages to it. I, I wish I could use Scrivener. I don't think that way, okay? So I do, and I encourage all of you writers out there, do what works for you. Go out there, g associate with people who are in the industry, but then do what works for so you. That, does, that kind of goes back to what you were saying. If you, before, we talked about your support groups and, mm -hmm. and meeting other groups right. in the industry. It gives you an opportunity to just ask people and then kind of try things out. What is going to work best for you and you can s probably switch it up in the middle right oh, absolutely so if you started absolutely order, you, yep. you certainly can and if you are a macintosh person you write in pages it, it makes no difference we just both happen to be microsoft people but um pages works exactly the same way and you can switch it up at any time okay good okay so you've done all these things and now the next thing is finishing the book right what is what does that mean finishing the book that's my question. Oh my gosh! You get the hard ones, Jerry. Okay, so finishing the book. Type the end. The end. Well, committing to the fact that you're done. I mean, is it hard to commit to the finish? Is it like? What? No, it's not because I know I'm there. All right, it's like. There's nothing else rattling around in your head. Uh, no, it's uh, that's a good point. I mean, there really isn't anything rattling around my head. You know, okay, I, okay. Most of the books I write around 80,000 words. I know when I'm hitting that 60,000 word mark, it's time to start pulling this together. This comes back part to writing to market. People, most people don't like big, thick books, okay? And it's changed over time, okay? But they would like to have a manageable book. And I know I'm at 60,000 words, and if I'm writing to market, I need to move this thing along, right? So I, d I know the end is coming, and I, I just, just start pulling it together. Now, I may end up with 95, 100,000 words, and then the editor is going to come in there and strip some of it out. Okay. That's okay. All right. Okay, so but you just know you're going to finish and then you're going to send it to editing and they're going to strip it. Then you're going to send it to editing and then you're, they're going to send it back and then you're going to edit again. And then you can say, I'm finished with this book. Okay. So you finished your book. What's the next step? How am I going to publish this book? What do I actually want to do with this book? Will I go traditional? Will I go self-publishing? Am I printing seven copies or do I want to go wide? Okay, so when you say, how will I publish traditional or self-published? So what, um, tomorrow? Okay. What does that mean? Um, Pub, no. not, what does it mean to go traditional? Yes, okay. Traditional publishing means you use one of the big five publishing houses, Random House, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in order to do that, you need an agent. So once your book is finished, and you can't do it until your book is finished unless you're a known writer, you send, you, you send out query letters and you ask for someone to represent you. And when you find an agent, they send your book to the traditional publishing houses 
and find a publishing house that wants to buy the book. And there are lots of pros and cons for why you would go um, traditional versus self. But the pros and cons in traditional traditional ed, um, publishing is that when you finish your book and you sell it and you get that advance, you've lost control of your book. They then do all of the editing for you. They choose the cover design. They always change your title. Um, it, it is It becomes their book. The good thing about the traditional publishing is there's gravitas behind that. So you have their marketing arm, you have the insignia on the back of the book, it is easier to sell to libraries, it is easier to get big name interviews. So those are probably the biggest reasons to go with traditional um, with the added caveat of that agent who will help you market and will get you on talk shows and will market your book because she gets paid by how many books you sell. Okay, so then the other option is self-publishing. So I have a question for tomorrow first. Okay. My question is, how many, what percentage of authors get agents that get published by major publishers? Oh my Lord, it's so small. I don't know, it, was, it just came out. It's extremely small though. They get agents. Yeah, they, they get, get agents. agents. Like maybe one, less than 1%. Probably. You know, yeah. it's so, so the real world is, you are going to self-publish more than likely, okay? And there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages to that, but I like the advantages as much as anybody would. It's like, number one is you remain in control, okay? A lot of us become authors because it's our baby. We want to do it. We want to control it. And you get to do that with a hybrid. But with that comes a heck of a lot of responsibility, okay? Huge amount of responsibility. So, you know, you're, and we're going to talk about that process a little more today and then again we're going to talk about the marketing what have you but it's all on you okay back to your writing becomes a lifestyle because uh, i got to tell you honestly the easiest part part for me is writing the book okay it's whatever comes next that is difficult so again like tomorrow said you lose control of your book with the uh, uh big publishers but the opportunity there is for a lot of money but that's only for a very small percentile of people so uh, I like also about the um, self-publishing is the fact that I learn so much, you oh, know. Right. It, it's just an absolutely amazing Keep what you learn. Going, Keeps right. your brain going, and again, you have more control. It's expensive uh, to self-publish. Honestly, you can spend anywhere from three to $8,000 doing everything you're supposed to do okay a little more than that but don't want you know we don't want to scare anybody away we got another we have another podcast coming out we haven't you tune back in but i would say that i honestly spend somewhere between five and eight thousand dollars doing it properly and uh, most of that is caught up in in the editing and the rest of it is in the marketing but again it's very fulfilling and it's the way that most of us have to go so you know climb aboard self-publish okay. i want to say one of the biggest pros for self-publishing is surprisingly enough you actually earn more money because it, when you traditionally publish, yes, they give you a nice little uh, buying advance. They bought the book, you get your advance, but you don't earn any more money until all of the all of the costs are paid off, and so and your royalty is a smaller percentage of those five bucks that are out there to split up. You know, it so. is incredible. I was reading up um, not that long ago. My mom and I were talking about this idea for a children's book and I started looking into that and it's pennies. It's pennies. When you work with a major publisher you get pennies, pennies for every book that's sold mm -hmm. and when you sell your own you set the price and you know what your marketing budget is and so there, there's all those things. Okay so we've chosen an agent or we're gonna self-publish we finished the book and now there's something called a content editor. If you don't have a traditional publisher before you can actually publish this book yourself, you need content editing because a content editor is someone special that reads the book in a special way and they are looking for every possible fallacy. They write a big report while they're doing it. They compare the blue-eyed lady to the green-eyed lady to make sure that they all match up. They get the names right. Um, my first book I called Heathrow Airport Heathrow at a time when it was still called Gatwick and it catches mistakes like that which you really want to catch. Um, so you hire a content editor. The content editor can be 
yourself. It can be your friend. It is best if it is not yourself. It is best if it is not your friend because it needs to be somebody that is not familiar with the book that will in fact comb through it and find all of the errors. So Jerry, you talked about the cost of publishing and you mentioned in there that it was a content editor. What what, what can someone expect to pay for content editing? Well, um, it depends on your, obviously on your content editor and but I'm going to preface that by saying first is when you find a content editor that you like, hold on to them. I mean, it's just a, it's difficult to find someone that you can really mesh with and work with. So um, it's, that's very important. F find one, keep them if they're doing the job. As far as cost, I've heard as low as $1,500. Um, I've paid as high as $2,500. But it's an investment. And it's a very worthwhile investment. The content editing is a, there's different ways too uh, they can do it. Some people hire a content editor and they will just do all the work and send it back and this is what it's gonna look like. I don't do it that way. My content editor and, and I go over every single change they're recommending and we decide why. And most of the time I go with it or um, if I don't go with it, we have to make some changes elsewhere in the text where it, it is going to justify oh, keeping the change together. where it all yeah. comes together, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, what was that? What was that? Something weird is going Excuse on. Excuse me. Okay, so you've been your, you've got, got your content editor going, and then the next thing you have to do is rewrite again? Again. Ugh. Rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. But while you're doing this final rewrite, you're all the time thinking about, I, am I getting the punctuation correct? Am I doing everything? And all of these editors are paid by the hour. So as you're doing this rewrite, um, I use a program called ProWriters Aid. There's another one out there called Grammarly. And so I am checking my writing to see whether or not it's going to pass the last edit which is the line edit or the copy edit. So then would you say that it's a good idea to use Grammarly or ProWriters Aid, like you write by the chapter, at the end of every chapter so that when it goes to your content editor and um, the copy editor, you've already done a lot of that work. Yes, in my case, I don't leave it till the end. In any, no, even if you're leaving it to the end, one chapter at a time, um, they get overwhelmed. If you have 85,000 words versus 1,500 words, obviously you can, ed the Grammarly can edit 1,500 words quicker. So that's like one chapter. Um, I actually run everything I write through ProWriter Aid two or three times before I even send it to my writer's group. I'm kind of anal. I like to make sure I'm not going to be too embarrassed in front of my peers. <laughs> what about you, Jerry? What do you do with your, like, grammar copy editing before it goes to the copy editor nothing <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much true i don't um i do review it la 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 i really hate grammar okay it's evident it's very very evident that i hate grammar when you look at my manuscript but one thing that i do that is very helpful is called um read aloud basically and it's not, I'm not talking about you reading it aloud because what happens is yeah don't not read aloud yourself because when you read it aloud yourself, you're just repeating what you've written down, and it, you're gonna miss it again. Right? You already know. You think you know it. You, you think, think you know, know it. Wrote, you think it. you know. Has anybody ever read a sentence here out loud? Someone looked at you and said, "Didn't say that." Right. Okay. So what I do is I use the read aloud on my um, Word, and um, I read along with it quietly. And it's reading, and it is amazing how many mistakes you will find. Um, amazing. So that's what I do. I use read aloud. It helps a lot. Cool. Okay, and that's part of Word. It's built into Part of Word, but it's built in. Okay. Does Scribner have a read aloud functional? Absolutely. Okay, yes. So either one, you're yep. going to do it. It's lovely. Nice monotone voice. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. It's nothing like the audible people, no. right? It's nothing like I use the Japanese geisha girl to read back to me. <laughs> Which is why he never puts a quote mark at the end of a line. <laughs> <laughs> Periods are flying all over the place. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the process of writing. Schedule writing time. Tamara does it by hours? By, I do it by the amount of time I'm going to give. Jerry does I do it by word count. Okay. Once you do that, then you start actually writing the story. You can do it like Tamara does. I plot longhand and I character outline longhand. Jerry. 
I just go mental and just uh, out it goes. Okay. And then you choose what program you want to use. Yes, use a word processor. Doesn't matter what one you use, use a word processor. The days of the manual typewriter are gone. Use the word processor so you can correct your errors. So you use? I use Scribner. And I just use the word program. Okay, you're going to finish your book, and then you're going to edit, edit, edit. Like, we're so over-editing. We are right? so over-editing. So over <laughs> and then the next step is choosing a publisher. So your choices are? To go traditional. Or to self-publish. Okay. There's co pros and cons to both. We've talked, we talked about those. And then you're going to hire a content editor, which is different than a copy editor. So, Tamara, a content editor. A content editor checks the content. Is there continuity? Is everybody's the same character all the way through the book? And then a copy editor. Copy editor is my lifesaver because I hate doing grammar. And they go there and they get those periods and those commas and those quotation marks. So will your copy editor ever comment in the same way that a content editor would comment? Not typically, but I am fortunate that I do have a wonderful line editor that actually reads for content. It's just a bonus, and sometimes I get some feedback, and I'm so grateful. One of the interesting things about that is um, the traditional way to do a copy edit is from the last word of the book forward, which means they aren't reading for content at all. They are really reading for spelling and grammar. And that's how I proof my, read my own stuff. I read from the last word back. I, I yeah. read backwards. Yeah, that's, that's the only way you can yeah. prove your own stuff. I would have a stroke if I tried that. <laughs> that's because you're an analog dude. You have yeah. to go straight through the process. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right. So and then the next thing that you're going to do, the final thing, is that you're going to release advanced copies. But we're not talking about that today. <laughs> uh -huh. So this is the second podcast in the series. In the third podcast, we are going to talk about marketing, 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 and that includes releasing your advanced copies. So I hope that you have found a lot of great information in these first two podcasts and that you'll pop in and join us for podcast number three, how to market your book or possibly short story, um, including releasing your advanced copies. So Tamara and Jerry, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks so much. And Good everybody, you. if you all have questions, please uh, you know feel free to ask questions in the feed. This podcast is going to be posted on all of our websites, so we will try to keep an eye on those comments and make sure that your questions get answered in the feed. If you are watching on YouTube or Pandora, or I think my stuff is on Google Podcasts, please be sure that you like, subscribe, and click the notifications bell, and that way you'll know when the next podcast gets released. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you for the next episode, number three, marketing, marketing, marketing. Thank you.